Thank you very much. And uh, good evening, everyone. Um, I am so thankful to the International Wood Culture Society, particularly Director Mike and uh, Secretary General uh, Jin Ling Su for the invite and the sponsorship. Um, I will be discussing, I'll be discussing with you this, this evening about a dominant woody species near human disturbed landscapes on Mount Makiling, Luzon Island, Philippines. This is actually um, a mountain managed by the university. So this is uh, actually a forest reserve managed by the University of the Philippines. So the objectives of the study would be to, to find out the woody species structure and dynamics in various land use types in Mount Makiling, Philippines, and to determine appropriate measures to conserve biodiversity, hence sustain the wood culture. You see, the Philippines is one of the many nations in the world who, uh, where wood culture is deeply rooted in our, the houses are made up of wood, the um, furnitures, the arts, these are made up of wood. Um, I don't know, uh, recently I have never seen some bridges um, made of wood, but uh, before I've seen some rural uh, bridges made of wood, and I do not know about uh, foundation, the wood foundation. I think this is quite interesting if we have some uh, hard wood in the Philippines, uh, which I think could withstand termite attack. So I think uh, this could be used uh, for that purpose once uh, this would be properly publicized, maybe. And uh, this is actually the peak of Mount Makiling. This is a very small mountain, but this is just an hour from Manila. That's why many people are visiting here. Uh, many American and uh, um, European uh, botanists have been uh, doing expeditions in this uh, mountain long before, uh, in the, um, during the 15th, uh, 16th century. Um, here, the Mount Makiling actually is, um, should be somewhere here. It's in the Luzon Island. Um, the Philippines, as you know, is composed of uh, more than 7,100 islands covering a total land area of about 300,000 square kilometers in the westernmost of the Pacific Ocean. So this is the study area, actually, about uh, 500 uh, from 300 to uh, uh, 500 meters above sea level. I had 40 plots here, but uh, and, uh, we have here the uh, results, the pro uh, number of species about 89, the number of genera about 72 in 42 families in the 40 plots I have uh, set up. I compared the diversity measurement, uh, which was done by Brown in 1919 when the University of the Philippines was just established by the Americans in 1910, and uh, Brown was doing a study in 1919 uh, there were 44 species, and now there were 89. And um, the Fisher's alpha of brown was 28.2, and mine is 33. The Shannon index of brown was 4, and now is 5. And I think this is quite understandable because uh, during that time, it was still a climax uh, forest, and there were uh, not that variety of uh, processes in the ecosystem. As of this time, it's quite a secondary forest, and therefore there are lots of uh, uh, ecosystem processes right now which uh, bring up the uh, Shannon, Shannon Weiner Index. And then I tried also to compare Mount Makiling, this, uh, our particular study, with the diversity index using Shannon with different um, uh, mountains in the Philippines, and also that of southwest China, Thailand, and Borneo, and uh, more or less we approximate that of the other uh, parts of uh, Asia. I found out uh, five land use types in my study area. Yeah, we have I, I identify them arbitrarily: the forest edge, the residence with some people uh, living in the area, the agri-farm, and then we have the buff, buffer-like zone, and then we have the less disturbed forest. The mean and maximum uh, uh, BA in the various land use types we have here, the near, uh, the land use type near the residence had, had the highest because uh, you see this is managed by the university and therefore people could not cut even if they are near the uh, residence, and then followed by the less disturbed forest, of course. 
and I use the canonical correspondence analysis, and it's shown that uh, altitude, distance, and slope uh, uh, were the ones um, causing this uh, distrib uh, distribution in, in different land use types. However, other factors which were not uh, evaluated, which were not investigated, like temperature, relative humidity, rainfall, disturbances, and many others, could be one of the causal factors as well. And I tried to, uh, I tried to uh, examine the Shannon index uh, in the different land use types. And uh, the buffer-like zone would have the highest, uh, and uh, followed by the uh, less disturbed forest, which means that there would be more uh, ecosystem process in those uh, co uh, causing the more diverse uh, um, Shannon. Dominance in the vulnerable land use types like the agri-farms and the ones near residences, these are uh, more um, introduced species, of course, and cultivated ones like Cocos nocifera. Uh, ficus, some of the ficus here are indigenous. Uh, Jimilina, of course, is uh, introduced. Spathodea is introduced, and Suaitania is introduced. Different set of dominance were found in stable land use types, we, and these are all indigenous. Uh, to the area. Dominance in both stable and vulnerable land use types. We have Ringa pinata, which is actually cultivated. We have Celtis and Diplodiscus, which are indigenous species in Mount Makiling. And I found out that the original dominance, the, the so-called Philippine mahogany in market, that's why I, um, I noted well the previous presentation that uh, uh, using using uh, common species would not do much good, especially in trade. In trade, uh, the Philippine Depterocarp is known as uh, Philippine mahogany, but uh, actually this is Depterocarp, not the mahogany that we, we know, not the Suetenia macrophylla or microphylla. So the native uh, Depterocarps in Mount Makiling are still struggling. Uh, they are still struggling. They, are, they belong to the very the lowest uh, DBH classes. And uh, I found out that dominance extend, the lower dominance uh, became the dominance in the upper, lati upper altitudes um, occupied by the dipterocarps, which were cut during the 1940s and the 1950s uh, lagging. Because uh, during the war, uh, there was lagging as well uh, during that time. So the dominance uh, uh, that occupied uh, uh, in the lower altitudes, um, tried to encroach into the upper altitude as well. Maybe this is a uh, succession, but later we will see. This is the same as that of the northern vegetation in the Philippines. Uh, I have documented the zonation of the forest landscape in Mount Pulag, which is the highest uh, mountain peak in Luzon Island, and uh, the second highest in the entire Philippine archipelago. I found out that um, uh, the pines, which are uh, lowland, uh, normally in the 2,000 meters, they encroach into the upper elevation once the oak were cut. So uh, after that, uh, we have observed this for several years already, and the oak really would not be able to regenerate uh, uh, even after pines have established for a long time. We expect that oak should be able to uh, manage, but then because of the topography, it's a, it's a very steep topography, it's a cordillera, and therefore um, oaks uh, could never be able, uh, will never be able to uh, uh, reestablish. So our pines are topoedaphic climax, actually, once they occupy the, uh, the areas uh, with cut or deforested oak forest. These are actually the, um, uh, I tabulated because the previous was not that uh, um, clear. So the Pinus forest is encroaching into higher altitudes, actually. And then I tried also Mount Akiki, which is also a forest, a high peak as well, about 2,700 meters above sea level. Um, this is in the northern mountain. Again, I found out that lower dominance are encroaching into the upper elevation once the upper dominance are being destroyed. I also found this in the southern mountain in Mount Mayon, which is a volcanic uh, peak. Uh, it erupts every six to 10 years, and therefore uh, this uh, causes a lot of disturbance in the vegetation. However, uh, compounding to this um, natural disturbance, there is that uh, big uh, disturbance caused by uh, 
Sweden uh, agriculturists. So we have the same observation here. Lower dominants are encroaching into the upper elevation. Uh, it's here, uh, a better uh, rendition. So I would like to summarize. The data therefore show that upper elevation species, when destroyed, a farm was established by some people. Uh, later, the farm will be left, and then giving upper elevation species a chance to reestablish. However, as found out in, in the northern uh, mountains of the Philippines, the oaks could not reestablish. Uh, we have never, we have never yet observed the vegetation in Mount Makiling because it was just in the 1950s, so it's still very young. The dominants, in fact, are still occupying very low DBH classes, and therefore, um, we could not still say that this, uh, the, the Deptoro crops would not be able to reestablish after some time. But as of this time, uh, the same is happening in the northern and the southern mountains of the island. But um, if the dipterocarps would be able to um, reestablish, then um, the, the dominance now are just successional species. Unlike the pines in the Cordillera, which become topo uh, dominant uh, uh, species. So the upper elevation species could not reestablish due to changes in the microclimates and uh, edaphic condition as well, and even the slopes like the oaks in the northern Philippines, and then more adapted, lower elevation species colonized the vacated space in higher elevation in Mount Pulag, Astronia of Mount Mayon, and the Diplodiscus of Mount Makiling. Environmental issues leading to loss of original dominance and degradation of ecosystem services uh, in, uh, would include the cutting of trees, Sweden farming, bioinvasion, habitat degradation, loss of biodiversity, and changing beliefs and traditions of people. Because you see, if we review the worldviews about human and his or her environment, we have the preliterate view. Human is not set apart from nature, but a part of a single order, um, consisting of the human nature and their gods. The relationship was really mutual. It was perfectly mutual. During the modern era, of course, natural resources been treated as an entity uh, dominated and manipulated by human for his or her own advantage. And therefore, here, human is dominant over nature. According to Aldo Leopold, uh, this is always my inspiration. We abuse the land because we regard it as a commodity belonging to us. However, when we see the land as a community to which we belong, we may begin to use it with love and respect. And therefore, what should be the immediate action that we have? I think this was, um, this was um, discussed uh, with authority by our uh, colleague from Tanzania, I think. Uh, biodiversity education uh, among adults, youths, and the kids should be pursued. Because uh, the government normally would only be uh, uh, campaigning for adult education, but then the kids are there. So I think uh, it was uh, perfectly discussed by our colleague. I think um, the kids and the youth should be involved as well. It should be a total enterprise. And then after they have understood the thing, then there should be com community land use planning and zoning by the community. And I think a biodiversity corridor has to be constructed or established as well. Because you see, um, during, the, uh, his, during the past uh, deforestation, only fragments of the forest were left. And therefore, species in these fragments would not be able to migrate to the, fa to the other fragments. And therefore, uh, we have to build some sort of corridor in between so that there will be free uh, movement of these species from one fragment to the other. I have a collaborator from Thailand, and we visited the Ranong uh, after the, after the um, tsunami. And then um, we found out that the, uh, that the vicinities had been explored, explored, explored for salt pans, shrimp pans, and all. And therefore, they have destroyed the mangroves. And so uh, because of this uh, tsunami taking place in Thailand, uh, the government has been very cooperative and then my, we were proposing for the establishment of corridors uh, in the, um, 
or in the Andaman Sea side of Thailand. And then there should be strict enforcement of existing environmental laws and ordinances. I think this was also uh, well um, discussed earlier. Uh, but I, I would like to add that there has to be local, regional, and international collaboration because we will be learning from each other. I think this international symposium is a very big example of this interdisciplinary and transdisciplinary discussion because we cannot just be confined within our, uh, within, within our shell. So I think, again, this international symposium is a very good uh, indication, example. And then there has to be intergenerational cooperation. Uh, the youth has to be involved. Uh, we cannot just meet among ourselves, but then we have to involve the youth as well as the kids. I think during the opening ceremony, the kids were well uh, were participating so well. So I think uh, a very good example of intergenerational uh, cooperation. And again, I would like to emphasize the latter part of this. When we see the land as a community to which we belong, we may begin to use it with love and respect. And when there is respect for the land, then biodiversity is well safeguarded, and hence there is assurance of sustained ecosystem services for humanity. And there will be sustainable harvest of wood. Uh, if we are to align this with our uh, uh, topic for today and the celebration of the world today, for every wood-dependent family. My collaborators and graduate students here, uh, professors from Japan, and then some of my students, and then fund sources from the University of the Philippines. We have from the Southeast Asian Center for Graduate Studies and Research in Agriculture, Japan's Ministry of Education Research Grant. We have Japan Society for the Promotion of Science and Research Grant, Japan International Cooperation Agency, and the International Wood Culture Society. Thank you very much. Thank you.